Thanks for, for joining us in this uh, first seminar of the academic year in the in the series of seminars that we are organizing within the PhD program of aerospace engineering. I see some new people, I guess new students. So welcome to the to the department, welcome to the to the program. Um, it's my pleasure today to to introduce or to host Andrew Glidal from the University of Loughborough. Loughborough? I don't know if I, right, I'm, yeah. I'm pronouncing it. Right. Um, he is gonna, he's going to give a, a quite transversal talk on a, on a very hot topic today, which is 3D printing, but 3D printing uh, with mechanical properties, which has a lot of applications, including aerospace engineering, including composite materials. Uh, Andrew uh, studied mechanical engineering at the University of Leicester, and then uh, he joined the University of Nottingham for a PhD on... on, on stock. Or, or a postdoc, okay, okay. You did a PhD in Leicester and then mm -hmm. postdoc, where he started to to apply 3D printing to biomedical applications. And well, over the past years, um, or in 2017, he joined Loughborough University, and now he's a senior lecturer, uh, researching on on these uh, fascinating topics. Uh, he has published many papers, open source codes. I, I encourage you to check um, the the website uh, for some highlighted publications, and I'm sure he's going to give also some highlights today. So, Andrew, uh, floor is yours, our pleasure. Thanks for being here. Perfect, thank you. Okay, yeah, hi everyone, my name's Andy Glado, as you just heard, uh, and I'll give you a bit of a, a soft introduction to me, some things aside from research, and then the whole rest of the talk is gonna be about research. Um, but I'm kind of just a real engineer. I like engineering and maths and stuff, so going to barbecues, this is something I love, so if anyone's chatting to me later, we can start a conversation with barbecues and, and see where it goes. I have two kids, uh, which take a lot of time, but then, um, you know, I still have now two pet, two loves, the, the research and 3D printing and the, and the kids. Uh, but that's where I'm, I'm at the, a few years ago I did, I released my software open source and a lot of the stuff I did with it was artistic stuff on Instagram. So that lampshade is kind of one example of a, a use case of the software to say, look, you can do some pretty cool shapes with this, but it's very much a hobby. I'm making videos kind of late into the night, just sort of interesting stuff. Um, and then more recently, I've decided I really like rooftop bars in Madrid. Andrea gave me a very good tour of, of several of them. So this is a new thing uh, and American football. But yeah, most of the time, everything's kind of, as I said, engineering is something I've always been uh, passionate for without even realizing what engineering was. And that comes through to then all my research here, which is quite diverse. Um, and I've tried to stay quite general, do lots of different things, all with a common theme. So a bit of the background, most of the talk uh, is about this 3D printing software and stuff. Initially talking about you know, why I wrote the software, why we were doing 3D printing in this different way. And then uh, the last half is kind of using that software which most of the stuff I've researched and published has been about things we've done with using the software without saying this is um, new software, this is a publication about software, it's been a publication about mechanical properties or pore size or something. Um, so there's only one paper, I think, which is actually specifically about the, the software. So a bit of background, uh, the process I've typically researched is this extrusion 3D printing where we have a feedstock material might be pellets or a reel of polymer filament. Feed it into the back of this hot metal chamber. That's going to melt it, and then it's going to extrude from the end. And this is an example of a tissue engineering nose. You can uh, take other materials, so carbon fiber reinforced materials with short fibers will just flow. You can have continuous fibers coming in, and they will then naturally uh, orient in whichever way you want in your in your part. And you can also use this for metals, ceramics, and various various other things. I got a project on printing drugs, printing concrete, um, and it's still the same thing of material coming out of a nozzle. The standard way of doing this, 99.9% .9 of people would, would say this is how it works. You get a 3D model, any geometry, just the, the model of the actual 3D stuff. You take it into some software which looks at it, splits it into layers, and then for each layer, figures out how to kind of fill that layer with a, with a path to move around. Very similar for other, other processes like uh, milling, laser, uh, bed, powder bed fusion and things. 
Um, and then once you've got that print path, it doesn't need to be solid, it can be more, uh, more interesting. But you get that, then you manufacture, you get your parts, characterize, and then you generally find it's rubbish, it's done everything wrong, not what you expected, so you come back and you change either the 3D geometry to try and get something different, or you change all your settings that are converting the 3D geometry to your, your tool path, or maybe you change something in the actual manufacturing, like the room humidity or something, but this is less, less common. So that's the standard workflow, but when you really need like perfect quality, it's quite difficult to implement this kind of feedback and say, I really want to get rid of this tiny little pore in one little location and think, how am I going to change my CAD model or my settings just to change that one annoying thing? Uh, it's a really difficult feedback loop. So some of those problems, this was a, an example of tissue engineering scaffolds, very simple research. We just wanted nice square pores to grow cells and see material properties and things. So we have these blocked pores at the top, as you can see. The reason they're created is very logical. The print nozzle is moving down to the end, a little bit across, up to the other end, a little bit across and down again. And it, when it's at those edges, it's decelerating, slowing down, so you're getting more polymer coming out. It's kind of pulling the material round, uh, so it's pulling it from the side into the pores. Um, and it's kind of logical why, why that's happening. And a really tiny change is just to come to the edge, move outside a little bit, then go across. Go to the other side, move outside a little bit, go across. And that just takes the defect from inside the structure where we're interested about, to outside the structure, where in this case we had, we did not care at all what the outside of the structure looked like. It wasn't possible to get rid of the root cause of the problem. This was a very elastic material. We couldn't solve those problems, but we could make sure our structure was perfect for what we, what we needed. Some other um, stuff that was done to sort of see what was capable, what was achievable with the normal roots and identify uh, where we might do things slightly differently. This is like a stress test to see how small we could create features and then 3D print them, like thin walls, thin pillars, uh, and thin, thin cylinders. This is a top-down view of those thin cylinders with a different wall thickness, 0.4, 0.6. The nozzle's 0.4, so the software's quite happy. I'm gonna do that with one ring. With the 0.6, it gets this really complete mess. It's not 0.6 at all. It has these bulges on the outside and stuff. Uh, and what it's actually doing is this really complicated toolpath where the white lines are where it's trying to move from one bit to another without printing. Uh, and it's actually printing one line, 0.4, and then thinking I got half left. So it's kind of printing a few other lines to try and make up the other half, which is just not the, not the right way to do it. You just print that wide. So you just tell it extrude 50% more material, do exactly the same path, but extrude 50% more. You get exactly what you want. It's so obvious, but it's not there as an option in the normal workflow. So there are many instances where the, just the, such an obvious thing you want is not really achievable. So that's where we quickly went to custom print paths. Now we got rid of that whole workflow I described for CAD model, slicing into layers, getting the print path, then getting that into G-code, which is some, just some text file that you stick on your printer. Manufacturing and feedback, now we literally design every single line that we're moving through, every single line of G-code, if that's not a physical, like, geometric movement. And then if we need to change one position in that whole structure, we just change that one position in the whole structure. We have complete control of everything. Um, makes things a lot more difficult because you can't use all the nice CAD packages that make you uh, create a, uh, objects very uh, simply. But I've often been talking about you know, a little square. We don't need CAD to create a little square. We can do this. Many applications, many things can be done with uh, maths as well. So this is an example of uh, the mathematical formula for this helix shape. Super, super simple for your X, Y, Z values. So we can describe all of the coordinates in these types of um, tubular structures with really simple equations. And then it's truly parametric. You can adapt it really in a way that you can't with uh, a normal approach of kind of generating a, a CAD model. And this would not be the easiest thing to generate in CAD. Creating a 3D model for it is a pretty large file as well. Uh, a lot of unnecessary stuff going on there when actually you just want the nozzle to follow this uh, path, which might be mathematical, might be not, but it's maths is really there. This is uh, 
a gyroid like structure. Oh, let me try and get my mouse over here. This is like a gyroid type structure, which again is mathematically defined. Very simple mathematical formula to generate this, uh, the toolpath for this. Um, and then you can really instantly change things, like change the wall thickness in just one little zone for it. If you've got a defect at the end, change how that end is printed compared to somewhere in the middle, this kind of stuff. So Excel design software is how it started. This was a tissue engineering scaffold research similar to what I showed before. Here, instead of trying to avoid those blocked pores, we wanted to open up the pores from the side. So we did these like triangle things to just keep the nozzle away from the side wall. And then you can see on these uh, images here, this is a side view, masses of porosity there compared to the default toolpath, which has almost none. This is we wanted cells and media to be able to flow in the side of, of printed structures. A super simple change, super simple uh, toolpath, uh, but it's still not very nice for someone from a purely biomedical applications uh, sort of background. Never done coding, doesn't want to do coding or manufacturing stuff. Uh, they don't really want to waste time learning that. So. In this case, I just created a, uh, the script, was written in Visual Basic, and then gave them this user interface so they could define all the parameters they wanted and get research in, in a really simple way. That was sort of a one-on-one -on -one research collaboration towards the beginning of my career. As I became a lecturer, I realized that would be really valuable, but I wasn't able to do a one-on-one -on -one, uh, custom Excel file for every single person I was interacting with. So then I tried to break it down to actually what sort of things would people be quite happy to describe in, in a design uh, and gave people the ability to do kind of a line, a circle, a polygon, just in Excel. So they don't need to do any coding, but they can say, I want a line from here to here. And instead of having to learn what G code is and how to program the X, Y coordinates of a circle, for example, they just write these uh, simple features in uh, and then they can get pretty complicated stuff. So it's no install. It's just using these sort of uh, kind of like the feature tree in CAD, but there are just features that I uh, found to be most valuable for my uh, students and collaborators. Um, and as I said, the ability to implement maths as a toolpath, a 3D line, was really valuable. And this type of uh, structure, again, the CAD model for this would just be a nightmare. If you try to export a 3D model of that surface and then try to slice it, into layers and stuff, it's just backwards. The way you would generate a CAD model for that is almost certainly with a mathematical formula. You wouldn't use the normal uh, kind of more human uh, features like radius, circle centers and stuff. It just wouldn't really be feasible. So then towards um, Python design software, Excel was great in some ways, but had limits from when you really wanted to do cool stuff. So I originally created that for people that didn't want to do coding to be able to do uh, these really simple but really valuable structures for, for research. Then in Python, I've created this library. These are all example structures, a nice big range of different types of things. Um, it's open source and people can now go in and use all of the nice stuff that everybody's making with Python. And I've got a software engineer helping me. Um, he saw the Excel version was like, okay, I see you, uh, what you're trying to do, but you clearly have no software engineering background and no one is really going to be able to help you going forwards if you're doing Visual Basic in, in Excel. And I still love the Excel version and the value that provides, but he sort of took me down this, this route uh, and was like, you know, what language shall we go with? And, and basically said, the cool kids are using Python, the new stuff is coming out in Python, let's just go with that. But it's not so much, it's a purely Python software, it's just a choice that we, that we made, uh, which is really useful because there are new packages coming out for 3D modeling, uh, triangular uh, surface modeling and stuff, even just in the last 12 months. So then with this, we can go onto more uh, interesting structures and more, it's more free to share with people, put onto, integrate into websites and things like this. So this is a, an example of one study where we're taking a very simple toolpath. In the top, you can see just a square. It's a square grid being printed every time, but just varying the extrusion width of those lines in a, in a formulate manner. So this is a really beautiful structure because if I print the left-hand one at the beginning and then gradually transition towards the right-hand one as I go through the layers, every single line is printed directly on top of a line that was there 
beneath it. You're not suddenly switching from 20 lines to 10 or on the right hand one, kind of morphing from 10 lines at some point to 20 lines at other, it'd just be a complete mess if you just tried to get the spatial gradient by moving lines, changing the lines width is, is really interesting. And it's just not done. It's in 3D printing software, there are some little things that do it, but it's just not there. People don't think about this type of, of design because they come from a, the top down route of here's my big thing. How do you kind of split that into little ones rather than my approach is from each little segment up. This approach of varying line width allows things like these um, tool, these uh, ASTM tensile testing specimens. The one over here is uh, the normal approach where you have say 16 lines here and eight here. And you're always gonna get some kind of stair stepping. Often it's inside rather than on the surface, but it's always a stress concentration and people get failures at the at the fillet section rather than in the gauge, quite commonly because the, of these unintended defects. Uh, so we saw this as kind of a nice opportunity for some of the research we were doing on varying extrusion widths. And now I have this, uh, this is an ASTM specimen that's printed with this smooth contoury manner. So you can see over here, just it's like a piece of art for me. It's just so smooth and everything's just streamlined. There are no stress concentrations. So these, will, they have tested loads of them and they just fail in the gauge. You're getting better results and it's a quicker and easier print path. So this is actually available for people to just go in and create the design. I've given the default ASTM numbers for widths at different positions and stuff, but they could also just go in and change that to be whatever you wanted. If this is a, a bone for biomedical applications, you, you can just go and, and do it. So then, that's the Python version is supposed to be accessible. People can come in and change this sort of, I'd say the examples I'm providing. Um, but then I've also made it even more user-friendly than the, the Excel version in a, in a constrained way. So this is the, my website. And here I have lots of example models that kind of showcase things you wouldn't normally think are possible with 3D printing. So this one here, is printing this uh, base ring and then a column and then a top ring. It's just printing it floating in the air. Uh, and loads of people have done YouTube videos on these and stuff. So this has uh, got like uh, 62 million people have viewed this, uh, this one video. The others have got multi-millions. And these are from uh, kind of the most famous people in the additive manufacturing world are creating these YouTube videos of something that is basically a spiral but nobody's thinking that we can print in midair uh, because the current design for manufacturing rules are based on a kind of a roundabout way of making CAD and slicing software achieve a printable file rather than actually thinking what can the printer literally print if I have a nozzle here and I can move around and extrude material. And if you think like that, you can do completely different stuff. So these are all sort of demos of that kind of stuff. And I have like, I think later of, oh yeah, I'll show you some videos later where I go into a bit more um, detail on, on that side of things. But the idea there is kind of like my very first delve into this was when I created that Excel sheet. So somebody I was working with could just change some interesting parameters and get the G code out. This is now like that, but it's in a really easy way where you can create one model and, and share it. And this uh, could be used for the ASCM specimen I was talking about. So when I try to take over the world with ASTM specimens, I will try to have, here is the ASTM toolpath. It's not a geometry because you can get the same geometry, print it in different ways and get completely different results. This would be the same results from different printers every time pretty much. So it's a really good um, way to, to get consistency. And if you're working with industry or something, you could package these up. All the code for this is either open source or gonna be open source when I have time. So you could create your own version of this web website, a local version that's completely uh, secure and stuff and give them this really cool uh, user experience where they can't make mistakes because in these websites uh, models, you have a limited on this sort of wavy structure up here. I, I say you can only have a certain number of waves, a certain number of a certain height and stuff. So you could pre-validate for aerospace stuff. This is key and for um, biological stuff. You could have a pre-validated toolpath that you've 
you've set parameters for the minimum maximum values of several parameters and you've proven there is no way that this toolpath will not work. That's just not possible with a conventional route of having a CAD model because every time you change it even a tiny bit you get a new toolpath and you would have to regulate the whole decision making process in the uh, additive manufacturing size, sizing software which is not going to happen it's just too uh, complicated and, and the strength of it is it's super versatile so it can just take any geometry and, and it'll work which is not what I can do but it's not going to be the way to get a regulated device. So then, um, just check time, it's a very quick run through some of the, the videos. This is uh, an example of a phone holder where now a normal model, you can't change its width and height if like you get the model and then you export it and that's that. With this, this was a great test for me where I could get people to put in different values and print it on all their different printers and check that it actually worked. And this toolpath is actually really valuable for things like medical braces, this continuous printing um, kind of natural um, lattice-like structure. So it's kind of a cool video for social media, but also I'm testing loads of things that nobody knows about, about how to get real additive manufacturing perfect printing working um, in a broader range of things. So this is like the website showing how you can change the parameters and then regenerate, you get your, your toolpath and you just click download and, and print. And currently I'm working on things like real time, so you don't even need to download and print. You can send it, respond to real time data. This was a calibration test. So getting 2000 unique parameter combinations printed in less than an hour. For a reference, you would normally, for this type of test, potentially print say six different unique combinations in maybe an hour. So we've gone from six to 2000 using less material. And this kind of super high throughput characterization and calibration process is where I think people should go if they think about how to test the, the process in terms of extruding single lines and stuff, rather than printing a whole big model that is kind of a proxy for what they actually want to test. Uh, this is showing the one that's printing in the, in the air. So this is just, as I said, floating in the air. It, it's just impossible in the, the normal rules. You're not allowed to design like this, but actually it works perfectly and you get much better quality than if you did um, the other way. You've seen this stent structure at the beginning. Again, you couldn't vertically print using the normal software. You have to do like layer by layer little circles or some other kind of mess, whereas it's actually very simple. This is my undergraduate student on a 300 pound printer didn't optimize temperature, material at all, just changed the, the speed and stuff. So we're not anywhere close to the limits of the process here. It's just kind of, oh, let's pick a couple of parameters, see if we can get some good results with them, and we did. So it's not a difficult thing. You just have to think about the, how you design and your structures at the beginning. So then that's kind of the, the software and generally loads of things I've done with it are, are trying to open people's minds and make them think, oh, this is actually useful. Well, as I said before, most of the stuff I've done with it is like really boring six, four lines repeated again and again to make like a hollow uh, square, this kind of stuff, but great for, for research. So for mechanical uh, characterization, this is a standard tensile testing specimen printed vertically, trying to get the interlayer bond strength. The actual bond area is this kind of, uh, whiter section that you can see between the layers. I've outlined it in pink here, uh, which is just a load of rubbish, really. The actual expected bond area is this green area. So you're testing mechanical properties. You're getting a value for strength based on the shape of that pink bit compared to the green bit. It's not about whether the layers are bonded together better or anything. It's just really weird stuff like in that case. The line on the right hand side has got a very thin contact area, then it's thicker, thicker, thicker. This big diagonal line is actually a defect when the printer moves from the end of one layer to the beginning of the next. This big bulge at the end is a weird combination of decelerated motors and over extrusion, um, kind of <coughs> leading to actually a very large contact area. So just uncontrollable, not print like uh, printer specific stuff that you just couldn't translate to a different material or printer are massively affecting your mechanical properties. So we said this is like not the right way to characterize 
interlayer bond strengths. It's fine if you want to know for that exact part what its strength is, but for research about mechanical properties, fundamental mechanical properties, you need a proper testing specimen where you can actually characterize the contact area between layers and this sort of thing. So we simplified it to just printing a, a square. It's dog bone geometry in terms of thickness as you go up through the specimen. So you can see over here, this is a really gradual taper in widths. So this process is typically, say it has a resolution of maybe 400, 500 microns. Here we're actually using a resolution of say 30 microns per layer to go narrower, narrower, narrower. Uh, because we're not trying to do something that the printer can't do. So it's like an order magnitude increase in resolution if you just work within the process limitations. We can cut them out with a rectangle um, cutter, so we don't need ASTM specific dies. When you do with, with them, you get the dog bone, you try and poke your specimen out of the dog bone die, you're always causing damage and stuff. This is from uh, one like 30 minute printed box. We now get 24 specimens, not, not eight. So we're talking about kind of two minutes per specimen, um, which means we do research where we get, say, a thousand specimens tested instead of 30, might be more typical, uh, which lets us just explore and do things like time-based studies of how properties are changing over time in combination with other parameters changing to get massively uh, more data. This is a fracture surface. so. It's just incomparable. You can see how it starts, where it, how it transitions. At the edges where there are slight stress concentrations, you can see different surface features than in the middle. Um, there's just so much more high quality data there that you can use to actually identify what's, what's going on in terms of mechanical properties. So this was then uh, testing the interlayer bond strength. We printed specimens, tested them along the the layer that was printed line by line, so along the length of a filament, that's what we got here on the left-hand side is the force displacement curve for um, a notched tensile test. On the right, it's the same, but we're testing between the layer strength. And of course, the material properties look much, much worse. We have a clear winner over here. But if you look a little closer and then look at, okay, the actual width there is, is a bit narrower. What is the force that we expect it to actually be like? If you take a bar like this and make it much narrower, you can just snap it, no problem. So actually, if you calculate the strength based on the contact area, we get pretty much bang on what it should be. So this is suggesting it's not the actual poor bonding between layers, but it's just the, the geometry. Like you take a piece of acrylic and you score it with a blade, you can snap it super easy. Same kind of thing is happening here with these grooves that happen because you're printing a polymer bead on top of a polymer bead and, and so forth. So then we tested it for all of these different sorts of geometries, different widths, different heights to test. Is it really working under different conditions? And generally found that it was. We've then tested it with different polymers, with carbon fiber reinforced polymers of all sorts to understand what's actually going on here in terms of bond strength. And it's not always the case that the strength between the layers is perfect, but probably more than half the materials we've tested it actually is, which is completely the opposite of what people would have been saying in the literature a few years ago. Uh, and people are gradually coming around to actually see this and make sure they characterize the bonded area and calculate strength based on the bonded area rather than the measured external uh, geometries of your, of your specimens. Stents, um, this is the kind of range of structures we ended up with. And for reference, the normal layer by layer approach would give you something like this. So the resolution on these um, is maybe three or four times bigger for their minimum strut size. They have all these defects that then they need to come and do some aggressive post-processing to get rid of compared to what we are able to find with just these perfect cylindrical extrusions. So this, this is the way you would normally take a 3D CAD model and slice it into layers and kick calculate a toolpath. So for these kind of intricate lattice-like structures, which again, very relevant to aerospace structures, if you want lightweight sandwich panels or something with struts as opposed to uh, surfaces, it just shows the sort of completely new design capabilities and quality that you can get if you think about the toolpaths. 
Other stuff I've been working on, I have a, a project for pharmaceuticals now. Um, this is, let me just mute this. Um, printing pills and measuring their, uh, how, how quickly the polymer comes out. So we tested different geometries with different structures, aligned and misaligned um, lines printed in 3D. And then actually used some of my other software to create this 3D model preview of it, calculate the, the real surface area of these and link that to the actual diffusion rate of drugs from these um, polymers. And generally found some interesting stuff that if you used exactly the same polymer, you could get really different rates of uh, drug release when you have, say, aligned filaments printed here versus staggered filaments pr printed here, because you just get much more flow of media through the larger pores. Um, and normally, you'd only get that by changing the material, which is really annoying for these kind of things, because then... Uh, you need to have two different polymers to achieve a multiple release rate drug, um, which is complicated, whereas this is very simple. Uh, I've already talked a lot about tissue engineering, but one very quick example. A nice thing was when we were printing this, this blue is polymer, and then this is hydrogel. And we actually printed these two layers of polymer first, and then moved the nozzle down a layer lower to print the layer of hydrogel. That was to make sure the gel wasn't coming on top of the polymer, which would have just ruined all the bonding. So it's a very simple thing. You're trying to do uh, two layers and then down and doing one that you should have already done. But it's very easy to do if you're designing the tool path. If you're not, if you're trying to automate this stuff and use the existing si software, you wouldn't really have that ability. So you get these very simple things could be crucial in terms of getting successful or not successful printing. So I've now moved on to concrete uh, as well for one of my main projects. Here we've got the printed structure at the top and the bottom, this is after it's been machined. So we're doing printing and machine of concrete. The toolpath for that is then needs to be a multiple, it's got multiple factors. It's got to be optimized for the printing process and optimized for this machining process, which is really dependent on how long the um, concrete's been curing for. So for things where there's more complicated stuff going on, not just geometry, uh, the toolpath is, is a really great thing. I've already shown this simulation for the drugs, but this is basically taking the toolpath, simulating the real fabricated geometry. So now you could do optimization FEA stuff on the real, predict, the real um, geometry that you get from the process, rather than on, say, a 3D structure that you're asking the process to give you, which you don't get. So this means you can optimize uh, the, the, the true process rather than what you're feeding into the process. And then uh, recently a link to the concrete and stuff is printing with uh, robots. So this is an example of one of the first toolpaths I was doing for a robot. Uh, and this is now recently we've been putting this extruder onto it. Um, this is just printing a nice simple structure where we could measure consistency of the printing process and stuff. But we're using this for printing uh, things like chest braces, which are importing anatomical models. So I haven't really mentioned any of that you can import normal data, geometric data from elsewhere and use that to design the toolpaths. Um, I'm not saying that's not allowed. That's just how um, it's harder to communicate that to people. So that's why I haven't released it. So then there's a fair few examples and yeah, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions about the kind of different specific examples or about the, the software. And then just briefly, thank you to everyone that's kind of been working with me on this, mostly on the top right there, my biomedical collaborators who have generally given me a lot of awareness of which direction is useful for software to go in and then the open source um, guy contributing and these are mostly my students and collaborators at Loughborough who have been really great in just kind of testing whether it's a, a, an appropriate concept whether it makes sense and that kind of stuff so and thank you all for your attention <laughs>